Welcome to Face to Face. This is a show about change and about what's next. It's a show that wants to ask questions, peel back the layers of our average everyday experience, and go beyond scratching the surface. We interview amazing people with incredible ideas and stories who have done wild, weird, and wonderful things. Remember that imagination shared create collaboration, and collaboration creates community, and community inspires social change. I'm David Peck, and this is Face to Face. So my next guest is Numan Ashraf, who is with the Rotman School of Business. He's a professor. He is a provocateur. He is a guy that you, you're, you're going to fall in love with this guy. He, he has so much to offer and so many things to say. And we talk about uh, pretty much everything, actually. We talk about uh, self-awareness. Uh, we talk about this idea of, of journaling as, as, the, uh, as an act of self-dialogue, having conversations with ourselves. We talk about exclusion and cynicism and about, about uh, diversity. We talk about uh, inclusion and about what it means to to uh, live a privileged existence. Numan is is hopeful. He's a, an agent of change, and uh, I can't wait to do uh, part two uh, in the very near future. And don't forget, uh, davidpecklive.com for more information about my own writing and podcasting and public speaking. There's a whole lot of other interviews there for you as well uh, to hopefully enjoy. And also on rabble.ca, you'll find uh, a whole other list of uh, interviews where you'll be able to uh, dig a little bit deeper. Uh, Numan uh, Ashraf coming right up. Well, welcome to Face to Face. Uh, we're joined by another very special uh, guest today, Numan Ashraf. Uh, did I get that right? You Numan? nailed it. I nailed it. Excellent. Thank you, David. We are at the University of Toronto uh, on a very slippery St. George Street at the Rotman School of Management. All universities are slippery by definition. I think that's you come true. In, you come in with a set of ideas true. and then you've been through us. Properly, What's, we make you slip. What I'm already loving about this is we haven't even begun, and we've already begun the conversation. Mm. Isn't mm. that wonderful? So I'm looking around your room, surrounded by uh, what appears to be business books. I look up on your whiteboard, epistemic privilege, public service, yeah. self as instrument. Have I walked into a philosophy class? Well, this I mean, you, I'm you're in kind of good company. There's Rumi here. There's poetry. My favorite book uh, of poetry from, by a Canadian author is George Eliot Clark, our poet laureate. And he has, in this book, a lovely little line that mm, I think mm. epitomizes my view on leadership. George Eliot Clark says, who was, of course, the E.J. Pratt Professor of Canadian Literature here, he says, grace is excellence performed casually. Wow, okay. Grace is excellence performed casually. Hmm. And if any of us have been in the company or in the midst of, of leaders who have just absolutely been a state of grace, it, this, is, this is the kind of rubric that we use as human beings to decipher that experience. So grace, can, grace is in the sense of um, kind of a, a blanket uh, that's, uh, or a circle that's kind of drawn around us? Could I, could I say yeah. that? In well, a, you could. And, and the underlying premise behind that is that the measure or the metric to me of leaders isn't what they claim. It's how they're experienced. So it's what they bring to the table? It's how they leave us. How they leave us. At the end of that interaction. So I walked in here, uh, we shake hands, yes. you offer me tea. Uh, within minutes you've given me a gift, an act of grace it seems to me. Two gifts actually. You gave me a, a, a Rotman School pen, I believe. Mm -hmm. A high quality, classy mm -hmm. pen. And, mm -hmm. a, and a journal, which I find fascinating. Mm -hmm. And uh, for my listeners, I'm looking over here... Uh, at about 30 blank journals, mm -hmm. cellophane wrap waiting to be written in. Mm. Tell me a little bit about, about what you tell your students and about, about, uh, about what you told me, about insights and about yeah. connection, connecting the dots. I think most people that are thoughtful, mindful individuals are sitting on a whole bunch of stuff. Mm. They're sitting on experiences. They're sitting on knowledge. They're sitting on tensions. They're sitting on things that are provocations, some that we've met and reacted to others, that we're pondering over. I think journaling to me is an act of self-dialogue mm. and having a conversation not only with an eye for reconciliation, but of 
challenging our current self with a view to an improved self through the process. So it's simply a way of having conversations with ourselves. Uh, you know, to me, documenting our insights as and when they appear to us is a valuable way of validating our experiences as leaders. And to have that recorded and to go back and to be able to see the different points of inflection that our thinking has had and hopefully our acting, mm. right, uh, is a wondrous thing. Evolution, change, yeah, yeah, for sure. Growth, for, growth, um, development, but also being able to pinpoint influences, mm. right? So I'll, I'll tell you a very a deeply personal anecdote, if I may. One of the one of the uh, Canadians who is today in critical care in Quebec City is somebody who's very close to me that I mm. have known. He's a former PhD student from the University of Toronto, and um, my sense of critical closeness, to do with the the attacks of the mosque in right. Quebec City, have uh, my sense of self has shifted quite a bit in the last you know couple of weeks. Not that I see myself more uh, likely to be victimized or anything like that necessarily, but myself as someone who needs to embrace that old adage about the personal is political. This idea that my own thinking about myself as a teacher, a scholar, uh, you know, somebody who is a provocateur intellectually and socially also has within it an, an element of identity. Mm. So to me, challenging axioms in the academy, disrupting status quo uh, statements has always been part of my repertoire. But now I also think about this idea of really acts of resistance at the point of, of, of civic engagement. So I'm grateful to Anita Bromberg and the Canadian Race Relations Foundation and her staff for including me in this conversation that's happening today at Hart House at the University of Toronto on the role of empathy in doing away with racism and other forms of pernicious ills in society. And the reason I am grateful to them is because the more intersectional approaches we can bring to this conversation, mm -hmm. the richer and deeper the learn will be, learning will be for myself and other learners. So, so how do you get students to journal? And there's a deeper question there. How do you get people to huh. journal, people to self-reflect? Sure. So the first thing, of course, with the students, it's easy. I give them marks, <laughs> right? So right. those who actually and, and gifts, yeah. And so, lots of tea. but but you know what? The, the gifts part depends if they actually show up to my office. Okay. Oh, right? I see. Okay. Right. So, so there, this, there needs to be. They need to reach out. Oh, for sure. Okay. For Good. sure. So to, to those, for those who show more initiative, for them, it will be even more. That's my perspective. So, and one of the courses that I teach, it's called Leading Across Differences in the Rotman Commerce Program. So we have a conversation about the role of identity and self within organizations, within individual um, practice, and so on and so forth. After each class, they have a journal. What are your key takeaways from this idea? What did the speaker say that, that made you think about your past? How might you apply this in the context of leadership within your current or future roles? And I say to them, you get a certain percentage of your mark by showing up in class. And I can't play to my preferences and say just because you raised your hand 16 times that you were actively involved. And if you're a thoughtful, pensive kind of person and you didn't raise your hand, it doesn't mean that you're any less engaged in class. The way that I measure a metric engagement is through the journals. And it's a bit of a Jedi mind trick. So they've been doing this for 14 weeks. And guess what happens? Inevitably, they come to me and say, I kind of miss that journaling. Right? Because it's conversation with self. Sure. And at the end of my course, the top five students will get a personal email from me saying, wow, it was a treat to teach you. If you want to you know, pursue further graduate study or professional school, I'd be happy to write a reference for you. Wow, nice. So, so uh, another, a whole other level of engagement. Engagement and also reward. Sure, sure. Uh, in, my, in my coaching practice with senior executives and so on and so forth, um, I, I have a particular kind of journaling technique, which is what I call designing your future self. And in that, I ask them three fundamental questions, two of which they can answer on their own through reflection. The first one being, so what's your superpower? Right? What's the one thing that you do better than anyone else that you know, pretty much? The second question, this is the one they cannot answer by themselves, is I force them, I compel them to actually interview five people, professional colleagues of theirs, 
with whom they've worked or are currently working, and they ask them this question. In all of our interactions, where do I or where have I added the most value? Put another way, what's my value proposition as a professional colleague? And I'm not asking them to ask or to you know, scrape down to the, to the bottom and say, what are my areas of development? I'm not interested in that. And the only thing they can say is, tell me more, please give me an example, and thank you. And that's it. And the idea is, we may think that we add value in a particular kind of way, but guess what? The value that we bring is often different because people see us showing up in a different way. Back to my first thing. My metric of leadership isn't what I claim, it's how I'm experienced. So I want them to have a sense of what, what we're experiencing. Uh, a, a friend of mine says, you know, we're all born on the wrong side of our eyes. Hmm. And so what that means is we can't see how others see us. We can only see as we imagine ourselves. So does this offer an insight into clearly into perception, obviously worldview, mm -hmm. uh, mental light, models, mental models, uh, assumptions that we make yeah. uh, when, when filters, lenses? I mean, if I'm if I've been born on the wrong side of my eyes, uh, I mean, I see myself in a particular way. I right. start to journal. I see myself in a new way. Good. And, and then the feedback. Read, That's the key thing right, about the second question. Right. Good. Is Good. getting real time feedback in a professional capacity. The third question I force them to ask themselves and they can answer this is in all the range of things that I do, from what do I derive the most gratification? Mm. And why that's important is, you know, you can have a superpower which adds value to people, but you might just hate it. Right. You might just dread getting out of bed and doing, I don't know, tax accounting or teaching or, you know, painting walls or being the head of the art gallery, whatever. Right. And I think design is not so much about just thinking. It's doing and trying new things so you can get into a different headspace and hard space. That's why journaling matters. So back to my other question then, how do I get others to journal? Can we do that? Is that something that you can, so, so you know, in context of tonight, in the conference and yeah. the Race Relations Foundation and racism and yeah. what's going on in the world currently, yeah. journaling is a step, it seems to me, towards others, Yeah. right? It's to, I mean, I love this idea of drawing a circle around us, mm. you know, this idea of an embrace mm. of a sort. Mm. It sounds very hopeful and idealistic. I mm. get that. Mm. But at the same time, aren't we kind of all in this together? <laughs> the hard, yeah. the, the, the challenge is yeah. convincing others. others. Yeah. So... You know, a wise person once said something wiser than me once said that um, if you know what you want, no one can stop you. If you don't know what you want, no one can help you. And I think why that's relevant to this question is if people are looking for insight about self, if people are at the precipice of discovering what their potential may be and actualizing it more to the point, then we can give them tools. And that's why I think this, the Canadian Race Relations Foundation is a wonderful opportunity and enabler of giving tools, programmatic interventions, ideas, influences. But to me, I, I think, and again, we're going to get a little bit into behavioral economics. We're nudging people to respond to the better elements of their selves. Right. right? This is just another nudging technique. But the difference in this nudging technique is you have agency. You have a pen. You have a journal. You, you, you dedicate time to it. So it is a deeply resource allocative procedure, but the one, one that's grounded in yourself. And if someone says, you know, I'm, I'm quite okay, I'm just fine the way I am, can't really help them very much. But so the one thing I do want to say though, journaling is a particular technique to get people to be self-aware. It could be making videos, it could be Snapchat, it could be tweeting, right? It could be dialoguing in ways that are meaningful to them. So I don't want to say that my approach or my medium necessarily right. is universal. Right, right. Well, isn't this what great art is about? Yeah. Isn't great art about helping you stand on the other side of you know, that <laughs> yeah. filter, the, yeah. getting outside of your own eyesight? Yeah. Right. So, so somebody journaling like this, I would expect in a humanities department, not at a business school, I think. So, so, so a good leader is clearly someone who, who is um, incredibly reflective but open uh, to others. Yeah, I mean, so Deep, deeply relational by the sound of it. Yeah, so I mean, I mean, the, the, de the deeply reflective part is, is a necessary but insufficient condition around self awareness. You want to be self aware. You got to know the things that drive you absolutely batty or things that really, you know, 
pick up your game, make you really happy. So you got to know what those things are, right? So knowing yourself is really, really important. I'll give you a, a particular predicament that leaders have. They go get all this feedback, you know, what am I good at, what am I not so good at, what are my areas of development? But they never ask themselves the question, which of these areas of development do I actually want to develop because that's the area I want to go in, <laughs> right? You can say to me, I'm really not great at Excel spreadsheet macros. It's not an area that I want to get better at necessarily. But if you tell me I'm not really good at offering and receiving feedback, that would hit me hard. So it seems to me that all of this, you would need to become um, more open to others, uh, more empathetic, you know, in for light sure. of our, you know, what's brought us here together today for our conversation, yeah. to, be, to be aware of any kind of racist tendency. I mean, mm -hmm. just because you journal doesn't necessarily mean you're going to pick up on that. Nope. So at what point do I then, I don't know, seek counsel? Yeah. Uh, is that why I come to school? Is that why I go to an art gallery? Is that why I take part in a program that the Canadian Race Relations Foundation has, yeah. you know? And I guess another question even before that is, how do I get there in the first place? Yeah. You know? Yeah. How, do we, how do we nudge those, or all of us? I mean, yeah. all of us, how do we nudge all of ourselves along? We, we seem to acquiesce towards what's easy, it seems to me. So I, I think we need to make it easy for people to be mm. relationally connected. Mm. Right. We, so instead of us saying, we will put this grand event together, it's one of many iterations of engagement. And you know, my, my other metric of leadership is a leader meets people where they are, but doesn't leave them where they found them by the time they're done with them. And that, to me, is the premise of a, a terrific lecture, a great art exhibit, a great cup of tea together, all those things. So I'm not Pollyanna about you know, how we can simply agree to have food and drink together and, and somehow forget our differences. Au contraire. It is in the act of sharing that we open ourselves up to be vulnerable with the other. To have a conversation with someone who's vegan and why they can't eat my favorite, absolute favorite arugula in the city. Right? Because it has butter. And, and so that speaks to their ethos of, of how they see the world and, 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 and themselves in it. Those small tweaks, those small opportunities for engagement can go a long way. I, I think you nailed it with vulnerability. Mm -hmm. we, we're not really vulnerable, are we? I mean, especially at a business school. Aren't we taught to be, <laughs> you know, to have these walls and, and to wear our suit and make sure our tie is properly tied yeah. and so on and so forth? Aren't, aren't yeah. we sort of, this exterior is well, really important, isn't well, it? Well, you know, that Maybe which not in your class. That which covers also uncovers. Right. Right? So that which we use as a mask to get behind mm -hmm. also says something about the way in which I want to be experienced. So might the blue suit and the striped shirt and the patterned tie be the, the, the ultimate Trojan horse? Right. Right? To get the legitimacy, legitimacy from an institutional perspective, but to open that discourse up. And you know, I mean, and that's, that's the beauty, by the way, of management theory. Hmm. It doesn't simply view necessarily people as units of operation. Uh, certainly in organizational behavior, we see motivation and understanding of people's interests as being pivotal to success. Majority of, of change initiatives fail because of that lack of understanding. Hmm. So to me... And you could, you could apply that across the board. You're talking about social change as yeah, well. You're not just yeah, talking about yeah. organizational change. Or right? personal change for that yeah, matter. Yeah, okay, good, good. Right? So back to your question at the yes. broadest level, how do we actually create change in people? Well, I guess I, you know what, I want to get others into this conversation that yeah. aren't currently here. Yeah. Right? And am I wasting my time? So I guess, you know, do you have students who are, um, do not see the self as an instrument, who, who don't see themselves as being, oh, hang on, I'm a professor, I'm self-aware, what do you think? Yeah. I don't need a journal, thanks very much. Yeah, uh, for sure, mm -hmm. for sure. I mean, and I think it has... Um, Something to do with the way in which you interact with people, where you kind of say that I am here, like I'm here. And what I mean by that is I'm here despite all of my baggage and my history, and I'm here because precisely of my baggage and my history. And it is neither something to apologize for nor to celebrate ad nauseum, but it is something that makes us us. The only thing that I say at that point in time is, but the future us is still up for negotiation. Right. Nice. Right? Well, see, that's, and that's, to me, that is kind of vulnerable. 
right? Sure. I mean, do you want to talk about empathy? If I want to step inside of your shoes, sure. whatever that might be, academically yeah. or geographically yeah. or relationally, yeah. I, I have to be wide open. And that that's kind of the challenge. And to be aware of sort of, the, as you say, the not yet. Yeah. What's coming. Yeah. There could be changes. For sure. Or there ought to be if we choose to, to have them. Right. Building on that metaphor. Yes, please. Right? On, on walking a mile in somebody else's shoes. Yep. My reminder to myself, first and foremost, is I've got to take my boots off first. Mm. And you can see I've got a few of them over here, <laughs> right? Um, and the point of that, as cheeky as that sounds, is to disavow myself of the privilege that I enjoy, which is my own experience. Let me step out of it. I'll share with you a particular anecdote that hit me like a ton of bricks and something that I did not, in fact, expect to hit me like it did. So I had the privilege now about a dozen years ago of taking about 15 students from the University of Toronto's three campuses, St. George, Scarborough, and Mississauga, uh, on a program called March of Remembrance and Hope. And we started off in Czestochowa in Poland and, and the Church of the, of the Black Madonna. And then we went, and part, as part of that, we went uh, to Auschwitz. Hmm. And I got to say, we landed in Auschwitz on this unbelievable spring day. Like the birds were singing, there were butterflies, it was green, it was lush, it was beautiful. And I gotta say, I had a moment of dissonance. Hmm. All the movies that I had seen, all the pictures I had seen were dreary and black and white and rainy and stormy and yucky. And so this question appeared in my head, which was, let's imagine I were here in the late 30s and early, in the early 40s. And there were soldiers here who were doing their thing Right? which was they were instrument of extermination. How did they repel the call of nature, which mm -hmm. is to enjoy the rhythm of spring, to listen to the chirping of the birds, to notice the flowers? Because that gives you, a, you know, gives you a spike in terms of how you feel about humanity in the world. And to me, then it, it landed, right? To acquiesce to a system of exclusion that leads mm. to extermination is a deliberate act that is designed to numb our, our sense of empathy for the other. And I say that to you because we don't have to go that, to that extreme to see right. the perils of exclusion. The moment I put prioritize my need, my desire, my right to the exclusion of others and don't pay attention to what their experience is, I'm not saying we're going to turn into Nazis, but I am suggesting that we are giving up on the probes that are there for us to respond to. And it hit me like a ton of bricks, I have to say to you. Nothing up until that point had really brought the, the, the issue home. And it was a very somber moment, and it was a very tough mm -hmm. moment for all of us. But you have to look at the juxtaposition that is so very real. And then the flip side of that is also true. When things are, are tight financially, and when there is a lack of social cohesion, and you're hearing things about people being excluded from certain countries and all that sort of stuff, when your natural inclination, right, is to be downcast, is to feel, you know, cynical. Maria Popova says, cynicism is evidence of the poverty of our imagination. Mm. We choose the path to cynicism because we have given up on our own capacity to imagine a better future. And I think you know, good programming, good teaching, good art, good food, dare I say, connects us with the potential to create. It's not, you know, I have a friend, her name is Rhonda Bloom, she's a, she's, a, she's a poet. And she said to me in the aftermath of 9-11, she found herself baking a lot. I said, Rhonda, what was that about? And she said, because I wanted to see stuff rise. <laughs> Seriously. That gave her hope. That gave her optimism. That's good. So I think Rana could say that because she was listening to herself. Mm. Kind of a, uh, and, 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 and maybe not even a, a formal journal. Yeah. But clearly somebody who has developed a sense of almost metaphorical journaling, a self sure. ref cognitive based therapy almost is based yeah. on this. Reflective notion. practice. Medi reflective practice, yeah. meditation, prayer. Mm -hmm. Right? Would you not uh, suggest that if if it's open, yes, and if it if it if it's inclusive, then it's 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 very similar, isn't it? Oh, in for sure, sense? for sure. The end result may be similar. The only thing I would say is 
do you apply the rigor to it? Right. Well, there's a discipline to, to, yes. to the actual yes. act of journaling. Yeah. By the way, the pens at University of Guelph are much better. <laughs> I'm uh, calling back to a but, joke but, but, that was made before the recording. But, 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 was you, but you recognize it's the holder of the pen that makes the difference. Correct, I do. They're yes. just mere instruments. That's the right. ultimate instrument yes. is the self. Yeah, but what do you do with it? What if the inks just start uh, <laughs> behaving well? Um, tell me uh, about systems of Touché. exclusion. Yeah. University of Toronto. Yes. Multicultural city. Yes. Canadian culture that yes. supposedly is warm and embrace you know we, a war, you know come yeah. to Canada and we'll offer you a warm embrace and yeah. and, and, and I say that with a, you know obviously with a tongue in cheek but there's sure. an awful lot going south of the border that we can yeah. stand here and kind yeah. of feel sanctimonious and point the finger but yeah. hang on a minute the light yeah. is shining in the darkness over here as well it yeah. seems to me yeah what, what, t can you talk about that yeah. the yeah. systems of inclusion yeah. uh, culturally and uh, on campus even sure so we, we've got to say one thing and, mm -hmm. and we've got to differentiate between two different phenomena which I think get conflated all the time one is what I, what I refer to as diversity by default. And the other is inclusion by design. So living in the most multicultural city in the world as rated by the United Nations, right? that's diversity by default. By default. By that definition. doesn't mean that we have inclusion experienced right, by design. So University of Toronto is a great example of inclusion, and I would begin first where people don't think about inclusion actually, is financial inclusion. Mm. Mm -hmm. We have a program called UTAPS, which is the University of Toronto Advanced uh, Placement Planning for Students. And what it says is the following. Anyone, any undergrad student that is admitted to, Canadian student that is admitted to the University of Toronto, and if um, they receive government funding, OSAP, or what have you, but there's a cap on that, but there is a demand on their resources on top of that cap, the University in Toronto will step in and will meet that, that gap by way of a grant. Not a loan, but a grant. Because it wants to make sure, this is part of the TUI recommendations many years ago, Carolyn TUI, who was our vice provost at the time. And that, I think, is inclusion is signaling to uh, aspirants to a system of meritocracy that if you have what it takes to get here and you're committed to it, we will be there for you we'll come to offer you access. Hmm. In terms of, you mentioned prayer. We are one of the most progressive campuses anywhere. We have what we call a multi-nodal space model around faith-based accommodation and spiritual accommodation. Oh, that's quite, I'd like to see that acronym. Can we, can we, can we whiteboard that right now? <laughs> <laughs> multinodal <laughs> multi uh, approach. <laughs> that would be right? a doozy. Yeah. And, and, and I'll tell you why. Yeah. We have the Multifaith Center for Spiritual Study and Practice. Mm. We have at the Rotman School here dedicated a space for meditation and reflection and mm. prayer. Mm. We have uh, that certainly at Robarts Library. We have a space in Victoria College. We have a chapel, uh, same, and, so, and so on and so forth. Sure, sure. What it says is, therefore, that students, faculty, staff, visitors, alumni, they don't have to park their identities at the door, at the campus gates. Right. And they come in. All of you is welcome. We have a huge um, set of programs uh, that speak to first-generation students. We have First Nations House, LGBTQ program resources, and, and, and activities of that nature. I mean, got, the, the range is enormous. You know, the other thing, and that's, what, that's why I've developed my course in, in commerce on leading quantum differences, is that if we can create the psychological safety and give students the tools to figure out what inclusion by design looks like while they're here, mm. boy, are we ever graduating the leadership acumen the world needs. Can we presuppose inclusion and, in a sense and say we are all included? What we've done over the last, what, 2,300 years or yeah. 3,500 years is exclude. We've yeah. gone out of our way to push people out. Yeah. And, and meanwhile, we've always all, all been in. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a little story. It comes yeah. from East Africa that yeah. makes the point. And the story, one day the lion comes, comes to dad, the lion says, Dad, isn't the lion the king of the jungle? And dad says, mm -hmm. of course, straight up. The lion's the king of the jungle. What sort of question is that? He says, and why is it that in every story that I read, it ends with the hunter killing the lion? And dad says, son, every story will have precisely such an ending until such time as when lions learn how to write. So the idea is this. Our metric of inclusion almost always begins with us presupposing 
that the stories, the narratives, the data that we have is representative. I'm not so sure. Mm. I think our claim to inclusion, the first metric of that is how broad and wide is the distribution of stories that we actually hear. Will they find their way into our collective consciousness? And that's why dialogue and discourse is absolutely vital I went, to pluralism. I went immediately to listening. Yes. I mean, one of the themes over the years uh, that I've been doing the, the podcast, so many uh, filmmakers and writers and so on, often the theme comes back to, uh, you know, we're kind of crummy listeners. It's true. We don't, we don't really empathize. It's true. I think to be a good listener, I actually <laughs> have to empathize with you. Yeah. I do have to put a pair of your boots on down yeah. here. You've got some lovely footwear, by the way. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I wore a lot of shoes. Like, there's a lot of hats. Yeah, lot apparently, of yes. But, but yeah, I mean, maybe we, we haven't really worn that metaphor out or that cliche out. You I, know, you maybe know, we really no, do right. need to start walking a mile in other people's shoes. You know? But I think it begins with an invitation. That's my last point to you. Mm. Mm. It begins with an invitation. Mm. And I really mean that. And for, for far too long, we have waited to be invited. Right? And I think that... There's a scholar by the name of Tomasello who says, as human beings, we are hardwired for reciprocity. So if we actually are the ones to initiate that invitation, to bring people in, to call them in, be it casual, be it small, be it short, you know what's going to happen? We are, we are going to begin a small but steady tidal wave of reciprocity where the next time you feel like you need you know, a shoulder to just put your hand on or to lean against somebody because, man, it's getting too much, knock on your colleague's door and say, you, you got five minutes? Mm. It'll be easier for them to say, sure, what's up? And I don't think that we can undervalue the, the importance of that dialogue because, you know, despite all of our technology, we're getting lonelier and lonelier. That human inter interface is so vital to our success as a society. And I think it's not lost on me that um, when you've had marches of protest. So I'll give you a very specific example now, which I think picks up on a Toronto piece. So there's some protests last weekend. And the Sikh community showed up with water bottles and tea and vegetarian samosas right on University Avenue. In the Sikh tradition, there is an institution. It's called the Langar. The Langar is a tradition of inviting people into the temples and whoever comes gets to eat. Gratis, free. But they took, they took Langar on the road, right? And I, and I think that's a quintessentially Canadian thing. Mm. Here are people that are protesting the withdrawal of civil, civil rights from people by virtue of where they're born. These are people of conscience. They might as well be in our temples. Let's go to them. Mm. I love that. Yes. I think that's such a quintessentially Toronto thing. Right? And why that matters is because they have made an invitation. Mm. Instead of sitting there and grumbling and saying, "Who? where the heck are all Torontonians? Why are they not in our temples? They know we've got longer going on. They go to where people are. And the amount of buzz that, that created, the love, the affection, the admiration, the respect for a community, for many, may, may have been the first encounter I would, I would in a civic so. space, yeah, right? So. Yeah. That's a beautiful example That's of beautiful moving away from just diversity by default right. into inclusion by design. And that it begins with an invitation. So sadly, we need to come to an end here shortly. Can I then say, is it, this isn't a leap, I don't think, but you're, you're combating racism through reflection, reciprocity, and relationships. Sorry for the three R's, but I'm, I am in a business geez, school. I, so yeah, that's, that's right on, if I can add a fourth one. Yeah, Please do. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. And, yeah. and, you know, every leader, every individual, irrespective of their title or the amount of privilege they enjoy, has the ability to invite to something. We must, not, we must not give that away. Be mindful in how we craft that invitation and do it. It's beautiful. I, I, I mean, I have to say, I, I, 
I'm I'm always a bit annoyed when my interviews come to an end. Mm. So uh, I'm hoping we can do part two and maybe even part three. Happy. Um, but uh, you you practice what you preach because I, I, I'm just going to tell uh, my listeners, walked into the room uh, within minutes. I think I'd been offered tea, some snacks, water, uh, tea a second time, I believe. Just in case you want to change your just mind. Just in case that happens. I wanted to change. It does happen. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. sometimes then, people don't feel the first offer is then, actually real. And you know me well because you have a free pen and, and, a, and an empty diary. I mean, it's just uh, great. You couldn't, you couldn't have given me a better gift. It's my my pleasure. Thank you so much for your time today. Uh, Numan Ashraf here at the Rotman School of Management University. University of Toronto, hopefully part one. Uh, thank you so much for your time. As many parts as it takes to get, uh, get people hooked in.